Welcome to the best session of all, right? The immune cell session. You make a very smart decision of joining us. Have to make a um, disclosure uh, and announce that the session is being broadcasted and recorded um, live on the HD YouTube. Um, and so be aware that if you speak up, everybody is going to remember you for eternity. Uh, that's not what's written. But, um, and so by uh, being in the room, uh, you're consenting for such media recording and its publication, which will be released on YouTube video. Um, and so uh, I will, instead of showing you slides, we want to spend most of our time discussing. Um, and so I let Nia go through the agenda. And then I think the plan is going to be to spend 30 minutes her main blocks, mm -hmm. and then uh, keep the last 30 minutes to kind of summarize. Great. Okay, so we, we had uh, some discussions before today to try to kind of come up with ideas of what uh, to talk about, and there's obviously an endless number of items you can talk about for an immune cell atlas or for any atlas. Uh, and initially, we came up with an endless number of <laughs> suggestions, but I think through our discussions, we, we reduced it to uh, a few points. And so we thought the first... The first thing we can do, uh, and maybe, maybe we should introduce ourselves who organize it first. So, I, so I, I'm Nir Hakoen, and I'm actually here at the Broad Institute. My lab is right next door to here, and I work really on primarily uh, immunogenomics and uh, immune uh, systems biology. I'm Kirsten Meyer. I'm at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge, UK, um, and I've been involved in um, some work on developmental immunity, um, together also with Mars who's sitting in the back row there. Hi, I'm Fabian Theis. I'm not an immunologist by far, but I'm interested in computational aspects. And I kind of like immunology because you guys are producing a shitload of, sorry, a large <laughs> amount of data. <laughs> large <laughs> data sets. Um, and that makes it exciting for us. And I should add the second aspect of what why I think it's really fascinating is because I think when we start studying genetic perturbations, mm -hmm. I would think this is one of the systems where we most easily get access to it. And obviously there's people, I guess also in the audience, uh, starting to do that. And I think from a computational perspective, this type of layer is hugely interesting. I'm looking forward to discussions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm Alexandra Klevlani. I'm a faculty at Harvard Medical School here at the Broad. And I lead the single cell genomics research program at the Massachusetts General Hospital doing a lot of human translational immunology projects using single cell approach. Good. Okay, so we as a group had a discussion and came up with the agenda today, which is basically trying to get at the points of what are the commonalities, what are the problems that we need to solve together, because, I mean, there's an endless number of projects, an endless number of discussions on what the projects are, and we can certainly come to those as well, but what we thought we would start with is first discuss actually just maybe for, fifth, how long maybe, how for long 15 minutes, minutes maybe the ongoing projects, just to get a sense for what people are involved in and what kind of projects are happening so that we know uh, how people can connect to each other as well uh, based on that. So maybe we can hear a little bit of, uh, from different uh, people in the room who want to just say you know, something about uh, what their goals are and what they're trying to do. Um, and that will, will help us think a little bit about what uh, connections are between the, the groups. And then the second big area, which is the re most of the time, I think we should solve whatever common issues we believe we have together. And so the, the first common issue is really the, uh, is it? Harmonization. Yeah. Harmonization, there it is. Um, uh, particularly the annotation, which we heard about this morning, the idea of having a place where you can actually commonly annotate, which we do not have right now. Uh, and so that's something that we need to figure out, and maybe through uh, computational analyses can, can work on that. So you um, not only annotate, but then also transfer, right, on new data sets and how to do that. Right? And tra yeah, and, and you bring the data sets together in particular. Um, and then the other part is on the experimental side, how do we uh, share the protocols uh, uh, correctly and discuss um, having some uh, consensus protocols that we all agree uh, and some of the QC metrics and so forth that one would need for those protocols and have that as a community agreement. And then the third, um, yeah, there are lots of questions there. And then the third um, uh, area is, uh, the last area, is uh, thinking a little bit about the validation question, which is when you do uh, identify a cluster or a set of cells or a trajectory or a state, uh, what, should, what kind of criteria do we want to think about for computational validation, for experimental validation? Uh, how do we want to um, 
to, to contribute kind of a shared view of that so that we have a you know, certain set of standards in the field. So those are some of the topics that we thought would be good. Um, and I thought we would start with the, uh, the question of uh, major the major projects and see what, what people are, are doing and what they're working on. So, you know, I can start. <laughs> so, so for us here, uh, we have um, a consortium of labs uh, across uh, Boston and New York right now that are forming uh, together to, um, to work on an immune cell atlas, which is um, you know, limited in terms of uh, not trying to get an immune cell atlas of every organ and every tissue, but limited to a certain set of tissues. You want to write it? Yeah. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, we're focusing on a human cell atlas right now and trying to get uh, as high quality as possible normal tissues initially uh, from a set of organs, um, for example, from the, the liver, the kidney, the colon, um, uh, the lung, and from lymphoid organs, namely lymph nodes and spleen. So, uh, so we have, we'll have two parts to this. One is to primarily do it from healthy tissues, from uh, as many healthy sources as we can find. And the second is to do some inflamed conditions, uh, not for the purpose of incre uh, for, for figuring out an entire disease, but rather to understand what kind of states uh, immune cells can enter in inflamed versions of these uh, tissues, uh, whether it's cancers or autoimmune diseases uh, and other, other samples that we can get uh, uh, within the community here. And we're certainly happy to discuss working with groups a a across the world on, on some of these topics and coordinating and making sure we're not overlapping and so forth. Uh, uh, but those are some of the initial uh, tissues, uh, along with blood, of course, which we are actively uh, working on, and many people are as well. Um, these will be uh, essentially in the next uh, couple of years, the, the tissues will be uh, focus, focusing on particularly. And although there are many atlases on these tissues already uh, as part of human cell atlas across the world, the focus on immunity is a little bit different in the sense that we'd want to go deeper into that space, into the CD45 positive cells, and get the more rare cells, get the trajectories. And on a standard atlas, uh, there may not be enough immune cells, because the percentage of immune cells in a, in a typical organ that's uninflamed is in a several percent, so it's not very large. So if you're, even if you're getting 10,000 cells on one tissue, the number of immune cells you're going to get there is actually very small, and you're certainly not going to dig deep into, uh, into that. So that's, the, that's uh, our goals, is to really go deep into that immune part, and it's really separate and complementary from all the other um, atlases that are, that are going on on the organ-specific atlases. Oh. Right. So. Um yeah, I think what uh, I'd like to say very much reflects what Moss has already uh, talked about this morning, that uh, to, in collaboration with Newcastle, but also with um, the Fungi Brain Repair Center in Cambridge, uh, we've been able to obtain fetal samples. Um, and in particular, the, the current work has focused on the yolk sac and then the developing um, liver, which is, of course, a major um, immune organ. Um, and of course, at that stage, or primarily, there isn't any infection or inflammation, but really the focus is on profiling different developmental ages. And we're very interested in understanding the developmental trajectories and how those may be different from the adult organ. And we're actually seeing that in certain cell types, like the B lymphocytes, for example, there's really quite a different developmental pattern uh, to the adult. And we want to explore that in more detail. So I guess we wanted to uh, do it. I mean, mm. we thought it would be. How, uh, we didn't know how many people to expect. Yeah, so we that's actually it might be nine people or something. So that's why I said like this people, is much larger no, people than we recognize. Based on the list we looked at. Yeah, but this they recognize is the ni the this coolest atlas. So yeah. we wanted to do a quick survey of people that I wanted to share what they're doing in like I don't know, thirty seconds. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of we get an overview. You don't have to, but we're trying to. Now opening it up, because so, it, it may help in setting up more synergistic effort yeah. moving forward. You do have to speak on the mic, so we have to kind of throw the mic gently around. Um, would you like to be the next one? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so I'm involved in a project called the Human uh, Vaccines Project. And so we're looking at... Um, oh, uh, sorry, I'm Richard Shorman. I'm at the J. Craig Venture Institute. Um, so the Human Vaccines Project, obviously we're trying to understand how the immune system is responding to vaccination and also perhaps identify 
biomarkers that can predict vaccine responses. Okay. And so we're focused initially on innate immune cell subsets that we sort out before and after vaccination. Blood. And we're capturing those both from um, blood as well as draining lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. And we're also trying to include a protocol to do bone marrow biopsies as part of that as well. But I think it's going to be very complementary because we have a very defined perturbation and then we can look at how the cells are changing their states and, and things like that in response to the perturbation. But that's also always in healthy. That's in healthy individuals, yes. What um, Hepatitis B and influenza with and without adjuvant and things like that. And I should say, just, just to connect already, we have such a project in mice, so we should uh, uh, connect on that. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm Jimmy Yi, and um, I'm at UCSF, but we have a, an ongoing collaboration, actually, with the Broad as well, where um, we are basically sequencing <coughs> peripheral blood mononuclear cells from healthy donors, as well as patients with lupus. Um, initially, actually currently we have um, 130 lupus patients sequenced and about um, 50 healthy donors sequenced, although that's going to go up to about 100 as well because we want equal numbers of healthy and diseased individuals. We're much, mostly interested in natural genetic variation in this first phase, so we um, restricted the ethnicities to, to just looking at Asians and, and Caucasians and females mostly because lupus is a predominantly female disease. Going forward in the next couple of years, we would love to sort of scale that up and probably partner with the Broad as well as, as New York. Um, the goal is to, to get to something like 1,000 people looking at uh, three to four different ethnicities. Um, and for a subset of them, we would like to look across um, both seasons as well as during uh, different times of the day because we need very little blood to sequence. Um, and just some technical Parts of this, I guess the sequencing is done all in a multiplex way. So cells from different people are thrown together and then we genetically demultiplex. And we're talking about 5,000 cells per donor. What's the reason you want to go up to 1,000? Ah, um, we want to look at ethnic differences. And we also want to look at the genetic, modif uh, the genetic effects that could be modulated by ethnicity. So have you done some statistics to show you that 1,000 would suffice now that you have a sort of a, we, you know, in the human cell atlas, we call this a bird's eye view. Yeah, so that's, the statistics has been done on bulk RNA sequencing of populations. So it's a little bit different because we're not, you know, 5,000 cells, we're not capturing all the transcripts. So th some of those details need to be worked out. I don't think we're going to have the same power as getting 1,000 bulk RNA seeks at the level of a pseudo bulk. But certainly for specific cell types, we'll have more. Um, my name's Charlotte Nyack from um, Melbourne, Australia. And uh, myself and a few other Australians are also thinking of doing a PBMC project, but um, because other people have covered scale and, and depth, we're actually trying to cover ethnicity and try and cover Indigenous Australians, Pacific Islanders, and Papua New Guineans, uh, unique to our part of the world, to contribute that aspect to the project. And it'll also be useful for benchmarking. We'll do inter-site interomics controls. Are there plans to... So doing both genotype and single cell transcriptomics of the blood? Uh, for us? Uh, I mean, oh. in general, yeah. yes. How all, important? All so, so the, the, I think, in particular in blood, this is the stuff that you pioneer, right? Is that you can actually multiplex much easier if you have the genotyping. So I, I should maybe add, we have a small study in, 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 in Munich also on the immune system where we actually are interested in a perturbation uh, with, in this case, glucocorticoids. So you want to basically see how the normal population actually also responds to that. And we actually have some prediction models where we can extend this to much larger situations. So for example, if you guys are interested, I think we could actually impute them, the particular response. And I would really like to see how that connects to genetics, because for us, the sample size is not as large yet. How many people were you saying? Currently, it's, it's, it's 20, okay. but there's going to be potentially money for up to uh, 200. For all the glucocorticoids. Yeah. That's good, because that's many people get glucocorticoids. Yes. <laughs> In this case, for, for, for the correlation part, because you know, I, I just do the analysis, her motivation was, because that she wants to reflect stress response in general, also in, in kids' sense. Yeah. That's right. 
Everyone, uh, Adib Rahman. I'm from uh, Mount Sinai, New York. I'm the, the New York part of the He's thing the that, New York that uh, first one. <laughs> uh, I just want to also note that there's one extra uh, organ there, which is uh, blood vessels that we forgot to blood mention. Blood vessels, yes. Right. So, uh, my name is Jun Seita. Uh, I'm in both. Uh, the Leak in Japan and Stanford, United States. And I originally in the R. Weissman laboratory, so I can do both uh, the hematopoietic stem cell biology and all, all the de developmental pathways, as well as, uh, now I'm running in, uh, the laboratory for the deep running. So if there is any point that I can involve with uh, the deep running thing, so I'm happy to join. I just quickly comment separately. I'm Jay Shin, also from Riken. Um, so we're, I'm not really an immunologist, but I have joined a lab now as part of an immune project. But uh, we do a lot of technology development. We have a lot of experience in five prime end methods and phantom projects. And we looked at promoters and enhancer activities and uh, were able to um, understand the dynamic and interactions between them. So if anyone's interested in applying the five prime methods, we'd be happy to analyze. Um, we're also trying to um, get together a lot of Asian countries uh, together for human cell atlas. I think it'd be a good way to collect samples, uh, especially for blood and for ethnic uh, diversity. We'll just go around the room. Um, so I'm actually Bertrand Young from Biologend. I know several of you in the room, but uh, as m some of you may know, we're producing SightSeq antibodies for everybody. So uh, if you guys think that it'll help at all in your studies, just let me know. And if there are targets that we don't have that you guys want, you know, let us know as well, and we can you know, accommodate as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, we have 250 on, online right now, but you know we're gonna, we're in the process of making panels, pre premix panels. So sure. yeah, that'll be. But I think that's a good. Maybe this is something we should talk about. Shared, um, re shared reagents. Well, shared, re shared re reagents, but also because ultimately the protein size is going to be limited. How do we define from? You know, the transcriptome data, what could be the most informative markers, um, and not, it may not necessarily be the genes that are highest expressed in the transcript. No, absolutely, and, and your point uh, is well taken because we, if we had common markers that we agreed on in, even in a year from now, then that would allow a lot of comparisons that cannot be done. How about um, uh, MHC peptide um, complexes, which could also be used like site Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I should say that there's other people at UCSF who are developing a recombinant antibody panel. So that would allow us to standardize, right, the reagents. Is this with the uh, multi reagents or the REAs or? Um, it's, it's just a single chain fab. Yeah. yeah. But are those, are those antibodies that are from a commercial source or are they antibodies that are being developed at UCSF? There are antibodies being developed at UCSF. We have not explored uh, partnerships with other companies yet. So I think we should go through the, the more projects. Holger finally also, arrived. Holger Hein from Barcelona, from Synax AG. So we uh, recently got funding to do an atlas of the human B-cell lineage. So it's an ESC synergy project. And there we have two parts. One is uh, the B-cell lineage atlas, and the other is connecting the atlas to the patients with their CLL. So we have many clinical samples that are, all, that are also whole genome sequenced, whole transcriptome sequenced already. They were part of the Spanish CLL genome project. And we're following up on this now with the, with the B-cell atlas and with the CLL atlas on single cell level. So we do like a million cell single cell RNA-seq, half a million cell single cell latex seq and then the complementary part of the, from the CLL side. So is that all from blood or from... No, it's bone marrow, blood, tonsil, and spleen. So four sites and 10 different donuts per site. That's the plan. Tonsil, spleen. Yeah. 
actually I'm here as a guest because I'm more um, in the liver atlas, but I'm now <laughs> hearing about uh, leukemia. So what we are doing is we are doing a human um, MDS and AML, MDS. looking at the bone marrow with a focus both on the immune cells and on the hematopoietic compartment, but also on the stroma and on the interaction mm -hmm. between the two. The niche, it could right. also be useful in that context. Mm -hmm. So that's Dominic Grün Freiburg. Right? Dominic Grün Freiburg. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Fabian. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm Sonia McParlin from University of Toronto. I'm with, uh, I work with Gary Bader and the transplant uh, program at UHN. And we're describing the immune microenvironment in liver um, using um, tissue from healthy donors. And so we're using SightSeq. We're also using the VDJ solution and we're using the BioLegend um, SightSeq to mm -hmm. look at the different T cell clonotypes as well. Clonotypes as well, yeah. Great. Okay. Hi, I'm Muz Hanifa from uh, Newcastle. I think um, with Kirsten, we've touched about the development atlas, um, which is primarily immune focused, uh, but we also do some skin work from uh, surplus uh, plastic surgery, uh, profiling the immune and the non-immune cells. Can you say if that's just in, in healthy, this plastic surgery, is there some also some... Uh, Hello, my name is Diego. I think this is not, not working. So I, just I think this is for YouTube. So it's for the video, I guess. Ah, it's for, ah okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry for spoiling. Um, my name is Diego Haitin. I'm from uh, the Weizmann Institute, uh, Idoa Mitzlab. And uh, what uh, we are doing, uh, among other things, we are characterizing the immune uh, environment in, in cancer, in human patients, in collaboration with Europe and also with um, more and more hospitals in Israel are actually contributing with samples. So we have um, both single cell characterization of uh, immune cells, but also uh, clonality of uh, lymphoid, uh, the lymphoid compartment. Hi, I'm Smitha. I'm from Yale. Um, I'm also not an immunologist. I'm a computational biologist, but um, at, at Yale, there's one of the largest immune cell collection efforts, I think, at any university. So um, I have something like 200 patients with dengue. Uh, I have uh, data on immunotherapy trials that are going on um, in melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer, type 1 diabetes. Um, actually, the list goes on. So what I'm actually interested in learning is some of the things that what you guys are saying about specific considerations, like which tissue it's resident in and where it came from to maybe improve these experimental designs so that even though I'm getting millions and millions of cells, are they are they the right cells under the right condition to get the right amount of information? Yeah, my name is Joachim Schulze from the University of Bonn in Germany. <clears throat> we are having efforts uh, basically looking at very rare immune cell types. So there, is, there needs to be some pre-enrichment and these strategies have to be taken care of. That's one major issue. And the second issue is basically how can we link basically information from peripheral blood immune cells to tissues. And here's one example where we're looking at patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, to find out the links between the information from blood and the information from lung, uh, in this case, lavage. Um, and this is just the first example. We're looking at uh, some other um, diseases where this could also be linked, where we have two tissues where we want to study the interrelation of the immune cells in these tissues. Uh, Matthias Kratzler, University of Michigan, uh, nephrologist and computational biologist, uh, working with NIA and a uh, group of immunologists in the AMP to define uh, the end organ damage seen in kidney and lupus nephritis and the tissue resident immune cells uh, across the spectrum of rare renal diseases and common diseases, also involved with the data coordinating center of the Kidney Precision Medicine Project from the NIDDK, which is really the matching disease-oriented project to the HCA 
and really being the renal spy in here and conversely inviting immunologists to the renal session which we will lead tomorrow morning as I think these are clearly critical interactions for organ function and dysfunction. Great, anyone else still want to add their project? 20 minutes. Perfect. Do you want to take on this one? Yeah, harmonization. I have questions. Don't, you can look you can, no, no, but you can. So, okay, well, this is, this is an impressive starting, uh, starting point today. And I think that most people did not actually, because I know many of you didn't even say this, the scope of experiment. Uh, there are many more projects you have. That was just like an example. So I think if you multiply by five, that might, yeah. be, might be right for this room. <laughs> it might be ten, tenfold. So it's a really... A, I think as someone said this morning, the immune part has grown faster in, in, because it is accessible. You can get the tissues and the cells do very well when you dissociate. You know, there's a lot of things we, 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 we do well in. Um, so we thought that one of the main things we could talk about is how do we define the, the states um, of immune cells and how do we know um, that we found the same cell states um, in... in um, um, across the across uh, the project, and in particular, um, we wanted to find those reference states, the ones that are uh, the baseline. So, in some sense, many people discuss different conditions that they're studying, whether it's a disease or a vaccination or whatever it is. Uh, but we all need to agree in some way and need to find a way to get to those reference states that <coughs> that would underlie. Uh, every everybody's uh, initial state, which can be very complex. Go ahead. I just had a question. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about you mentioned inflammation in the beginning, yeah. and you kind of talked about inflammation in a disease state. Yeah. But what um, you know, there's also maybe inflammation in a normal state, and right. there's there. So is there is it a gradient or is it is it a, a bistable state or is it right. you know how do you how do you think is should we consider inflammation as part of the normal map? not just the disease map because... Yeah, that's a really good yeah. question. I mean, there's variation across individuals uh, in terms of their immune uh, states, whether that's inflammation or just an intrinsic threshold or, you know, what you ate that morning, I, that's, that's going to, that might be a little bit hard to define as inflammation. Um, but in terms of our daily lives, I mean, we, we're getting infected uh, through uh, constant uh, small... Uh, situations of infections where we might be dealing with it quickly. So you're right, there, there's probably inflammation up and down every day. But so in terms of reproducibility, we're finding pretty high reproducibility. Perhaps, I mean, I mean, you, you nailed the first point we wanted to discuss. This was not planted, so thank you. Uh, so perhaps what we could do is, like, they're all related. Read these three questions and start the conversation. So I think the plan is to try to spend about 30 minutes so per subjects. So I'm going to be timing it so we have time to cover a bit of everything and then go back. So going on that questions, we, you know, some of the points we raised included what are the reference states or healthy states for each cell types in an unflamed tissues? Do we need these to understand immune activations? And what is the source of healthy tissue? What's a healthy tissue? Uh, should we talk about the healthy tissues? Um, should we start with this? And then we wrote what is unique to the immune system that needs to be considered in designing um, studies compared to other atlas? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, an, uh, what is the uninflamed, is there such a thing as an uninflamed tissue? How do we get it? I just wanted to mention the difference between healthy and normal. Yeah. Um, just, you know, yeah. is, are we considered only healthy or is it normal? Because normal doesn't necessarily include, like normal population is different than healthy, I think. I think it's a really important point. So and I think, in this, yeah. I, I think it's good here uh, for the... I, I think what, what, what we, but I think in many situations, I think others also observe is that there's uh, sort of multiple axes if you do some type of factor analysis or if you sort of decompose, right? You would sort of see then the, then the inflammation being orthogonal to if you sort of maybe do longitudinal measurements or so to, let's say, the disease state. And in some situations, obviously, might be some, some response to that. But I guess if you do differential analysis with respect to your healthy versus your, I don't know, lupus cohort or something like that, you don't want to pick out the particular inflammation part. You want to see the additional effect to that. I mean, I find that interesting on the computation side to deal with that, but I would be really interested in how that is experimentally addressed first to make sure that, you know, this doesn't superimpose or sort of, sort of hide the actual maybe more subtle effects. So are you referring here also to metadata, like the type of information that would allow you to infer what type of tissues we're including? What type of metadata would help you yeah. in inferring that? Like, infer as much information as we can on the donors, 
sex, gen gender, medical history, like what would be helpful? I think you're going to have to discover the factors because you'll never know. Oh, great. It's a, it's a broad question. Yeah. I mean, there's only a distribution of normal healthy. There's not uh, a single... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the advantages of using the blood and hasn't been mentioned in one of the major projects is potentially time course and, or being able to monitor over a period of time of individuals. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a huge advantage and I think this flagship group should take advantage of that. And I think everyone's uh, baseline will be different, mm -hmm. but then their trajectories and how they respond to the infection will be similar. So I think that is something as a computationally good, challenging but interesting question. And I think uh, we should somehow wrap around the idea of how to coordinate this as a group. Right, I don't know of any study that has done that well. I mean, we did a little bit a few years ago, uh, and Jimmy actually analyzed that, and that was not, uh, it wasn't, wasn't easy to, to distinct, wasn't that easy to distinguish between the same person over time versus between people, although we did see a signal. Can, can you repeat what you did there? So yes, so we took the same individuals uh, with blood at multiple time points, but we also took 600 people, you know, 600 people worth of blood analyzed the states of their monocytes, dendritic cells, T cells, um, under different conditions. Uh, but we also, for the people who, which, which we did take multiple times, which was not all people, we asked how stable uh, the phenotypes were of the expression within the same individual over time versus between individuals. And maybe, Jimmy, you want to comment on that because sure. you've also been doing a lot of so, Yeah, so I, I think one of the opportunities here is, is obviously blood is accessible, but also the technology makes it possible where we can reduce some of the technical noise from even multiplexing across time points. If we think about everything as a pipeline, we sort of figure out ways to crowd preserve the cells really well, then you can multiplex multiple time points from different people. I think that was one of our challenges when we did the initial analysis on bulk is you have to prep a different library for each sample. And the difference is other types of labeling, for example, with, with uh, antibodies, right? Um, so, but yeah, I think, I think also just, you know, we did it initially as a replica. I think you're right that we should just plan on doing these experiments as a consortium. I mean, we're happy to take on some of that, uh, particularly because of so, how little blood you need to do single cell RNA-seq. Mm -hmm. We can actually do it over a 24-hour period, the cancer circadian rhythm. But over longer time points, it's going to take um, a big effort to try to coordinate over, let's say, a year. Or, and, and one thing I think is really cool is I like the vaccine study is we should maybe time some of these to, you know, specific perturbations, um, like, you know, getting a vaccine, but, yeah, so. I, I want to follow up there that there's actually our first method development towards how to deal with time series RNA-seq data, right? Which, you know, in bulk obviously has been done for a long time, but in single cell, what we currently mostly do is just throw everything into one big bucket and make an Ortiz or UMEP or something like that. But we know from particular development, I think Moose uh, has been studying these things, right, is that we, know that then some sort of populations turn in, 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 into later ones and you could actually, now that you have time, have a non-stationary state do some, something with that. And as I thought your suggestion with, I mean, maybe you have a perturbation, even just normal circadian rhythm or something like that as a background, just some covariate where something happens would be interesting. But then you want shorter, shorter intervals. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so in the YouTube channel, Kyle is asking if uh, someone is trying to characterize the NK cells. Ah, someone's asking if someone, oh, in case of, yeah. Yes. I mean, is there any specific project there? Okay. Yes, so part of our human vaccines project. Yeah, part of the human vaccines project, we're sorting out NK cells, myeloid dendritic cells, monocytes, plasmacytoid dendritic cells, and then seeing if there are subsets within those sorted populations. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And are you doing that in single cell? Just to yes, single cell, yeah. Um, well, while I have the mic, so um, I think another we, a lot of people are using the term cell state and cell type, and I don't think we're all using it the same way. <clears throat> so um, we have a working definition about the distinction between the two, and I, I think it would be worthwhile having a discussion to see if we can come to some consensus about that. Um, the way that we think about it is that you have transitions between types and states over time. That's true for both. What we think the biggest difference is is that a cell, cell state is reversible. So you, you, can, you can get activated, and then when that perturbation is gone, you can revert back to the initial state. Whereas transition between types is largely irreversible. Once you've made that transition, that's kind of a, a stable state, even when you remove the perturbation. 
So that's been our working definition of the distinction between the two, and I just, I guess I'd like to hear other hear people's other, thoughts other about that. There's someone there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is a contentious issue. So, so, so there's, no, but there's, this will, ago we started with that. <laughs> this will feed nicely into our discussion of how do we agree on, on what are the fundamental states and types or however we want to call them. And that may not matter how we call them, actually. Right, so right. So I, 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 the question I would have there is directly, you have T-cell development from naive towards certain steps to certain memories. You would now call them all basically cell types because... Yeah, but I think, you know, we have to be careful to reinvent the wheel over and over again. I mean, there's a long literature of, of immunology. If we kick everything out that the immunologists have, have done, we should be careful if that's the right way to go. Why not keeping that as state? I mean, do we really want to have 50, 1,500 T cells in the end, T cell types, rather than saying this is the T cell lineage, and it can be in very many states, because the functionality, for example, of these T cells is still very similar. You know, the difference between naive and memory is, is mainly that it's faster and has, is stronger. Yeah, and it's defined by epigenetic changes, but it's still staying a T cell. It has the same T cell receptor. So I think. It is wise to take some of the enormous thoughts that have been done in the immunology uh, community to just stick with some of the stuff they have invented already and yeah. then go with more detail into this here. You know, so I, I'm no, a little bit against this. The definitions of type versus state might, might be a little tough to make. I, it's yeah. good that you made it, but we need to kind of say something like, out you got to put something out. Yeah. yeah, but there are so many exceptions. And this does incorporate a lot of immunology. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can, so we, we had, but I mean, you know, a T cell is a lipid site too. So yeah. where, where do you draw the boundary? Yeah. Yeah. So we had discussion. Yeah. I think Stan and the, the broad audience had that today as well. Will we ever expect discrete ones? Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, I think it was one or two years ago when Eric, we were just talking there, the trajectory group, right? There we were always used to things being more sort of maybe a bit more dynamic. But there we also said the definition is essentially probability densities on that submanifold where cells lie. You know, they start to tend to, to overlap. And I think. Whenever you write up the paper, you should call it the way people have been calling it before so that they can relate to it, right? But I, it's a, I, I like the non-reversibility part, but sure, you know, there's so many counterexamples. There are counterexamples. Many. So, <laughs> it might maybe not. Under normal so, so conditions, we want many counterexamples. On the immune part, so I, I think it's a very well taken, but it's a more general question, and maybe yeah. we can not try to open that can of worms too much. Too far. <laughs> yeah. Although... Yeah, there's just one thing that I also want to add, and I think all of us <coughs> know this by now, that there's also a huge dependence on the tissue. So we, are, we and others, for example, look at ILCs, and if you look at them at different tissues, they express partially or completely different programs, programs, right? And then it's also the question if you still call an ILC2 an ILC2, um, uh, whether ILC2 uh, when a, it's sitting in, 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 in the lung instead of, the, of right. the intestine. And we don't know about the different functions because that has not been explored yet. And there is no body of literature that tells us about it. So I think this is a very difficult question. And we should also consider the, the tissue context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is a very important discussion, and I agree the kind of like resolving it is not going to happen this afternoon, especially whether we call it cell type, cell states, or whatever it is. At the end of the day, we have a transcriptome at the moment, primarily uh, defined cell identity, okay. uh, which we then have to kind of like uh, juxtapose or correlate to kind of historical names, yeah. some of which have value-laden kind of um, attributes some of them may not necessarily be, you know, still pragmatic to use. Um, and I don't know what people think about simply using the expression modules and having a descriptive term and then allowing the community to then make a consensus opinion <coughs> of what we should therefore call these cells uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, stops people having lots of different names and it is entirely descriptive. And, and it's also, also reproducible. Also, exactly. And it is, you know, what it is. The cell... Yeah. You know. And the, the problem comes when people start to try to create the hierarchies and the connections. Um, if, you know, really. In our discussion, we, we followed this up, so we kind of anticipated. We call it actually in the, in the points always states and types. But then we were asking also about how to represent those and potentially also deal with, those, with transitions between those and trajectories. And... 
I was wondering how, in, how and I think that's sort of the first question and those things, how, how many of those differential comparisons that say in, in, in lupus versus healthy or across, across persons you do on a specific cluster level or along a trajectory level and how important those type of questions would be. I, I could comment on that a little bit. Um, so this is sort of preview of some of the data, I guess. Is it's a it's a transition. It's continuous. Mm -hmm. Maybe expected because lupus is, you know, it's it's a autoimmune disease, but it's not so severe, and these patients are treated. Can we follow up on, on that? Sorry, su super shortly. Do you see in that situation different, really new cell types popping up, or see you just balances in population? Because I think test for those things and then deal with those later in, in quantification is very different, right? We see both. Yeah, so uh, uh, just to follow up on Jimmy and, and whoever wants, else wants to jump in. Um, and so uh, in the discussion of phenotype you know, and states, a lot of it, as Ms. mentioned, is, is done out of transcriptomics. So when you think about modalities that like, together can help you define the whole trajectory here, do you think that if you add other modalities such as, you know, protein levels and open chromatin that would change slightly your analysis? Are people, I imagine a lot of us are thinking about it because now these tools are more scalable, but how are you thinking about integrating this in your experiments and your analysis for interpretation? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> do some so this is just, you know, a cussed statement, but does, uh, sooner or later, I'm Kevin Moses from CCI, does the human cell atlas in the end Maybe not today, but sooner or later have to say what are the cell types. <laughs> yeah, that's actually the discussion we wanted to have, which is assuming that that's true, well, there's, some, there's going to be some truth. I mean, yes, variation between people will exist, but there's got to be some kernel of cell typeness or stateness that is going to be somewhat constant in, but you know, and disease, by the way, can do all kinds of strange things, so there will be differences, but there's, there's got to be a way to define it, and that's, I think that's the mathematical question also, and biological question that we simultaneously have to solve. Yeah, I think that the, the transcriptome state is one thing, but you never know, for example, if two transcriptome states can be connected or not. For example, if you have uh, a lymphocyte in the given tissue, you, you cannot know, if you can transfer it into another tissue type unless you do the implementation experiment, and it's not straightforward to do. I'm not sure how useful the definition is um, uh, to call something a cell type. So the correct question was raised uh, just, by, just before by Chloe was adding additional modalities. So there have been early experiments seeing, for example, branching uh, using attack, and I think it would be good to follow up on those questions. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll just give a good example of a state that I think that we run into on a regular basis, and that is <coughs> a stress response. So we're isolating cells from tissues, uh -huh. and frequently we'll see the upregulation of FOS, Jun, and Early EGR1, and things tissues. like that. To me, that's, that's a state transition. It's a stress response. It's something uh -huh. like that. We see that across many different types of cells. We all experience cells. it. Everybody's <laughs> seeing that. I think that's a good example of what I would think of as a, a state transition. Just, just to add... The mic for a second. Okay. Just to add to this, because this was one of the questions we had. Like, how can you distinguish between a technical state, yeah. which right. may not necessarily be, I mean, it, it does right. exist it in some contexts. Oh, yeah, we, we it see could, that it could happen. Yeah. But, like, what's biologically meaningful? Because that's one of the challenges of the immune system, mm -hmm. is that it's not exactly binary. So, you're asking about, like, questions of, like, defining cell type. Defining cell type main lineage, that's easy. Like, immunologists have done it. But we're after, like, rare cell type, like Kyrin mentioned, like, the rare ones. Like, how do you go about making an atlas that does more than just rediscovering the knowns first. And then it's all going to be about cells, whatever, trajectory, spectrum, so states. We should take a question from... from right, so... And then I... Maybe we can follow up that. Yeah. yeah, so Rike is asking if there is any repository with gene links for cell typing of uh -huh. immune cells uh, to standardize the field. That's right. So is there a repository? So Not... Is there a repository of this gene lists that would correspond to what we're talking about, the states and the, and the, and the types? And I would say no, no, there isn't. And everyone kind of tries to come up with their own way of doing it by bringing together themselves. We've seen this morning, uh, Peter presented, we have been discussing this analysis working group, how to actually come up with those lists in a reproducible manner, right? And different labs have different ways of, of, of dealing with those things. I think it would be important to first 
have some types of convergence, but then also obviously reflect the heterogeneity, and, and Peter Kajenko presented that, and I, I think that should be also in some YouTube movie, movie at some, some point, that there will be actually different confidences for different people, and then you can actually use those to transport this to your own data set, and uh, that you could also potentially use this then to not only annotate the groups, but also then the transitions and so on. So I think this will be happening at the moment. This does not exist, and DCP as it currently is would just store the data, not yet those additional things. There will be an add-on portal at some point. Yeah, so it doesn't exist yet, but the question is the key question, because that will allow us to do that. Because in this room, we're not going to solve the problem by discussing it. <laughs> Yeah. But we, you know, I mean, it would be good, right? I mean, philosophical to, to potentially think about if those different projects come up with annotation to quickly share. Yes. So we've been, for example, reaching out to some of those I data sets, and I mean, the sharing was by email at the moment. It would be good to have this a bit more systematic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. just to add that the organizing commi committee also felt this morning that, or this okay. lunchtime, that this was a really important thing, yeah. and that by collating this data and then having... Um, either the gene expression lists or the, the modules that must refer to, once we have a larger set of them, we can then actually start to see whether patterns emerge. Mm. We should ask, you know, what people are thinking about communication, about so I would like to come back to your point, do we enhance the primary map? And I think the answer has to be completely yes, it's very simple. Take the first Google map of a geographic city or something like that. It was very simple. Yeah, there was not much information on there. And you learned that there's a city, that's it. Yeah. Then the next version was, you know, we put on traffic jams. And then that's a completely new information level. Now we have 3D on that map. Yeah? So now, now we have pictures. And I think we should see our atlas and our maps exactly like that. There will be first line maps. Then there will be new consensus maps that we learned how to do this actually. How could we, do we get different maps that were built at the same time together in the next level of maps? Yes, right. Yeah, And then we will learn that we have to actually do more, like the geographers do that since 400 years. You know, Their maps from the 1600 look a little bit different than the maps we have today. Yeah. Well, you know, but I don't, do I don't think so. And we're much yeah. faster, so it will, you know, but we should learn from this and, and yeah. be sure that the ultimate goal yeah. will be, there will be cell types, but when we reach that, this, that might be a different answer. Chris? Just, yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would try to uh, 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 deflate the issue and, and just to be more, system, take a step back and be more systematic about it, which... If you if you base let's call them cell states for the moment. If you ba base cell states just on, on RNA on, on, on single cell RNA seq snapshots, uh, then there are two basic things to to to, uh, to to record. One of them, what's the distribution of the population? You get T and E plots. There's always a distribution. So what's the width of the distribution? It's not a single one. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the width number one. What's the width of the distribution? Probable distribution over 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 uh, 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 mRNA states. Number two. What are the like the trend? What are the transitions, as far as it's known, from one from one state to another state? Yeah. And that's an important attribute of the states: is what can they go into? We just talked about that, right? Now, if you have uh, if if you have uh, other data, other modalities, then of course it becomes a different question. If you have right. you know, open chromatin or epigenetic states, then the question is, you know, how long do those persist? And then you're talking about something else. But just based on mR mRNA, I think those are the two main things to to record. What you then call them. Become, depends very much on the question, I think. So your example, stress response, Joan Foster, so, then you would tempt it to be called one, being resistance or responsive or not, whatever you call them. Uh, so I think that what you call them often depends on the question you're asking, and we shouldn't conf confuse the two. Mm -hmm. Use the distributions as a base level quantitative description, and then the, the, what, you, what we call it depends on the question and the context. Mm -hmm. I have a short follow-up on this discussion on uh, how to enrich the data with additional layers. So one, I think, very obvious one that particular immune system obviously is happening a lot is based using protein side seq derivatives, right? And even in the first paper, already Rahul showed that by combining certain expression markers with very high confidence, you can actually infer a lot of those things. So what I would be interested in is uh, if those type of predictions get more robust, would an immunologist still like to see the true protein expression, or would be sort of these inferred things also be acceptable? Where do you see these things going? I guess just I can note that from our site experience, that there are protein expressions that are not apparent at all from RNA-seq data. They cannot be inferred. I mean, the NK cell example is a good one that was asked before because many of those cure receptor profiles just do not manifest by current transcriptomic methods. So 
at least for, for me as someone with a background more in cytometry rather than genomics, it's, uh, there's a lot of additional information there that's not captured simply by the, the greater breadth that we're now seeing. But actually, if I could also add, I think protein expression is one aspect, but I think going further than that, tying a lot of these states to actual functional readouts, like by, by experimentation, I mean, we can profile all we want, but we need to link it to, to something more meaningful, ultimately. And protein degradation. Right. I might just comment on, on naming. Uh, we ran into this with the dendritic cell field, is if you go in with a name with your kind of favorite function or a paper at the time, there might be an additional function that kind of supersedes in importance the other one. So giving a nondescript name saves you from drama down the road. That's just one little comment I'll make. I think one unique feature in the immunology field, speaking as a nephrologist here, is that you really can perturb your system. So you can experimentally validate if a transition state is, can actually be manifesting or not. And that's where this field actually could educate other fields, just epithelial cell organs, where that's significantly more complex, about tools and, again, ways to infer some of these uh, transition capabilities or not. Yeah, just on the pragmatic side, because we've also been uh, running into this with our liver work, so we see new classes of, uh, uh, of these liver-resident immune cells, and then we also don't know how to call them, and we simply call them by the most distinct markers. So I think we should go with a nomenclature that we have, uh, with the historical nomenclature, which uh, I guess we all agree on. So if we see maps from the bone marrow, we see CDC1, CDC2, PDC, and so on, and I think we can all live with that. And as long as we don't have functional validation of subtypes, you should just call them by markers or by gene modu modules that discriminate these subtypes. I want to, I mean, that's a very good comment. I think we're all running in, in, into this, this problem of looking at less, I think one of the, there's to play the devil's advocate here. Like if you just rely on legacy knowledge, which is extremely important, then we may limit ourselves in terms of new discoveries. So there is something to be said about that. And so it's a big question, like we wanted to limit time, but I, I, I do want to encourage everybody to give feedback on that specific issue for the next 10 minutes. I think Muz actually opened that topic and Yoen actually added to it. Like, you know, you mentioned, I define a new clusters, how do I name it, right? So that between us, when we start comparing data, we know that it's the same thing, right? I agree with you, let's limit drama <laughs> with, with going after function. So transcriptomics alone may not be sufficient, but it's a, it's a way to start. So instead of just reporting a marker, would you suggest like a whole gene module? Because a marker alone may not be sufficient. Yeah, let me, let me add to that point that I just made. So in our example, in the liver, we have now pro-inflammatory pro and anti-inflammatory kaffir cells. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a gene module. So it's MHC2, for example, or uh, so this is more a gene signature. So if you can classify the gene signatures better, I think we have, have a better way of annotating the, the subtypes that we observe. Right, so should we, should we go about signature base instead of trying to say like it's a macrophage? Maybe it's not a macrophage, you know, just to make it complicated, yeah. So I've been, I've been working on building ontologies for 15 years and it's very, often very controversial to come up with a cell name or a type name that everybody can agree upon. Different communities tend to use different vocabularies to refer to the same thing. But what we should be able to do is come up with the necessary and sufficient conditions to define the, the type or state. You can call it whatever you want. To me, that's, that's a minor issue. But I think having a real clear, crisp definition that's reproducible is really what we need to, to try to capture. Until you start looking at cells that are, looks a little bit like a T cell. Maybe it's an NK cell. Maybe you, know, like you have, like it. So, so, so the way that we're doing it is, um, we're, we're combining three components. One is the tissue source that the sample is coming from at whatever level of granularity you can capture. The second is what is the minimum number of marker genes that's sufficient to uniquely identify that type. And we've got a machine learning algorithm that we've been using to pull out the minimum set of marker genes. And then the third is what is a parent cell class that you can identify in our case for the, in the cell ontology so that we can link it into this reference knowledge base about cell types. Cell class. What? What do you mean by a cell class? Uh, a class that's represented in the cell ontology already. So for example, T cells are in the cell ontology. But you've defined a subtype that has a unique transcriptional profile. You want to say that this is a subtype of a T cell. And that way you can link it into that representation. So sh short remark, 
this minimal list of yeah. genes for differential expression are usually not that robust under depth of sampling, and there could be multiple rather orthogonal ones, as we all know, for breast cancer signatures and so on, right? That would give you exactly the same thing. So I think it's always good to keep the, you know, the whole uh, signature right. also. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back totally. to what yeah. Peter was talking about, about this annotation resource. So what we would do is we would contribute those as annotations to the cell types. That, we would say that, that we used this really algorithm, yeah. it came from that data set. Now somebody else might have used a different algorithm and they might have a different set of markers, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, as long as we kind of keep track of how these yeah. things were generated. I would like to challenge, and you know, just come back to that. Why not doing function? You know, it, it it is it is most complicated. It takes the most time. Yeah, but if you really have a new cell type or a new cell state that you have never seen anywhere before, why not doing function? Yeah, and then you say like, if that's really some a cell that does something completely different, because honestly, in the old days, think about the dendritic cells. You know, the first paper about dendritic cells by Ralph Steinman, nobody believed it because it was only showing pictures of their, the cells are looking different. Only the second paper when he showed function, then people said, oh, maybe that's a cell that's different. Yeah. And the third one, actually, he had really to show function. It's where three papers in a row. Yeah, the first one was not seen as the major paper. And I think, why not sticking to something we know all? <laughs> most, people, most people didn't believe dendritic cells uh, for a very much, much longer, and that's because the functions overlapped with other cells, <laughs> so that create, create yeah, but, but the point was, yeah. the, 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 it's, it's funny because you have to find the one that distinguishes them. Mm -hmm. But how do you make it scalable? Yeah, knowledge of function is pretty... I mean, and I'm just pointing it out there, actually. I agree sure, with you. you. Agree. Agree. And, and the function but changes. Mm -hmm. If you're a fungicidoid, if you don't hit it with the virus, you'll never you will never know the function. Okay, okay, so there, there are a few more uh, comments in the back. I just have a naive question, but I will ask, uh, how do you validate a hypothesis when you are trying to chart human cells? So do we all agree on having cross-comparison between species? I'm talking about mice. Yeah. Because we, are, we want to build an atlas, and by the time you're building this resource, we cannot... Um, about the function because we don't have the resources and the time to, to validate all the possible functions. I think it's more about finding an annotation that people can use to then further go into that and then also do the validation. But I think these are two different things. So yeah, what you said that already. This is the, the gene module. But you can test the gene module yep. on function. I'm not saying that you do that in the next few years, you know, but, yeah, but it's it's over time it has to be done. O right? Over time, of course, when you can really call something a cell type test, but I think rather the question should be how we classify that in the atlas so that people can look for entities, whatever you want to call them. So over time or when journalists start requiring it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is a very good debate in terms of function and what do we do at the early stages for annotation, and I agree there are two separate things. We need to decide how to label what we found based on the transcriptome or whatever modalities that we've measured. And I think it is important to, uh, to try and understand the function. But it's actually quite difficult to scale. You'll need to def you know, be able to pull out and you know, physically isolate the cells to study the function. And which function do you study? Because there are the ones that you, know, you predict you know, will be a functional attribute of the cell, but there will always be the... Exactly. And I think that's uh, you know another sort of layer to the <coughs> kind of like a. Keep the mic for a second, Ms. So I mean, you showed us beautiful data this morning. So about like annotation, you know, you're doing the development atlas with your colleagues in the UK. How can you relate your data with the with the adult data in terms of annotation? Like, how are you thinking about this? No, I totally agree. Um, at the moment, I think the, is is best to kind of like use a descriptive term. Uh, based on whatever modalities that has been measured so that it's easy for people to understand, to try and avoid using value-laden kind of historical terms because they mean different things to different people, and then to actually allow the community to then decide based on the kind of like repeated data sets from not just our work but various other works and the adult work to try and say what would be the best you know, name to use because... You know, it, it is, they're very different, the cells. Like, I think the example of blood and tissue or one tissue from another tissue, this is magnified even further, development to uh, adult. So I couldn't agree more, but, like, let's get practical, oh, okay. right? 
like, <laughs> get, like you want to put in a database, like, you know, for people to search. So how do we go about this? We name them like with ontogenous cells, it's a T cells, it's a myeloid cells, and then we go about modules and we call modules one, two, three, four, five, or we try to assign a, a legacy name. Like, let's get practical for a second. Who wants to answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many people. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Here, well, let's start from the left and go. I just, want to say it, I just want to say it seems like you'll never be able to get rid of validation, and the problem is it doesn't scale now, but maybe you should think about ways to make it scale. Um, so that would require new technology development models that can be run in high throughput, getting engineers, bioengineers involved who, who develop these systems routinely for, for lab on a, you know, organ on a chip or whatever, things like that at the Weiss Institute here or wherever else. So. I think you'll never be able to get rid of that. Um, and, you know, the reason is because even if you could guess computational methods to do it, like um, a pathway is correlated with function, or there's, you know, there's the immune synapse, there's multiple cells involved, there's an antigen, like, I just can't We're imagine. Still scratching the surface. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Okay, so I, I have a comment that I, I can make, but I think I speak a different language than a lot of people here, so I'll just go ahead and say it anyways. So one way that I think about data organization is on the basis of signals on a graph. So I think of data as a graph, and I think of things like genes, gene expression, protein expression as signals on a graph. So some of what you guys, I think, call cell types or lineages are low-frequency signals on this graph. Some of what you call transitional states, like cell cycle or activation states, they're high-frequency signals on this graph. So I think that if, and you can um, pick out these different frequencies in a graph and visualize them. So I think what should be done is you should analyze or annotate cells with you know, whatever, all the different information you have, and more or less build the graph out of it that the person wants to see. So they might want to see the graph that reflects more high-frequency information or low-frequency information. And that's just my thought of that. That's true. Per project, there's going to be very specific needs. Right. So the question is, how do we compare across projects? Not the yeah. same you, you, can, you can compare graph and graph manifolds across different projects. Yeah. Actually, I have several papers on this. So, so we but, do have a reference data set, like a first release of the new set atlas. Do we make a recommendation? So uh, reject parts of the data that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at least all those that do cord blood, well, okay, bone marrow, I guess. But you know, it, everyone is working on this paper, so there's not going to be anybody sharing because it's not even has been fully annotated. So I think the question how to get things together. So this, you know, this was a big, big heading. We haven't really answered it. Answered it. Uh, I guess practical, like you know, well, the signature. Like, how do you put in a uh, database or something that we can all navigate and compare new we're looking at the same immuno liver in class 2 high cell like how like you know how do we know that uh, is that practical uh, it may not be practical I want to put in a sorry uh, I want to put in a vote for to, to objectify these, these, these things as much as possible so let's say let's take the two, three things quickly one of them one of them is function you have to define function uh, and one way to define function we can go on for a long time about this is function is interaction so it's say make explicit yeah. in the atlas uh, in terms of if you talk about function, what does A do to B? What does A do to B? Whatever it happens to be, you can, you can enumerate. In the context of something or other. Okay, so number one, the object of our function. Number two, an important attribute of any cell state is the response to perturbation, agonists, antagonists. Record that, uh, and that's an aspect of function as well, but make it clear what that is. What was, what, what was the perturbation and how did the cells react by some objective data item? And, num and number, number, uh, 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 and number three is the, uh, is the context, which is all of that, say what the context was. And, and you just said that, for example, cell of origin is one, where's the tissue from? Or if you do the experiment with perturbation, or A affects B, digit cells, whatever they do, uh, you know, say what the context was. So objective definition based on actual data and say what it is. That was really good to give a definition of function. Uh, comments on that? Yeah, can I just make a suggestion that I think is different from what everyone else is saying? Um, what if we turn this into a machine learning problem? I like the fact that you're going to have annotations. We have, a lot, we have a large community. If we just start annotating cells based on the information we're given, that's our training. Then. I mean, I think what's hard here is that we just don't have, this is unsupervised learning that we're trying to do. What if we turn it into a semi-supervised learning problem? At least for part of the data, we, can, we all contribute, label the cells best we can, then go back and see if we can learn computationally what are the common things, right? 
I think uh, one. Can I? Yeah, I just want to make a comment that, yeah, uh, just in that, uh, comparing or learning from past consortiums. I mean, I feel like we're trying to do human genome sequencing and encode all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we're trying to annotate a gene and then trying to understand the functional element of the genome at the same time. What, what, are our, what is the purpose of the human cell atlas and does it come in phases? Because human genome also came in phases and also at the ENCODE. So yes, I think we should look ahead and think about function, but I think as a consortium, we should really try to define what is the first phase, what's the first release of the human cell atlas. Just, yeah, and then kind of come up with as a first milestone as a group and try to move on from that. But uh, yeah, with, with the long-term vision, but I so think it should be practical. On the organizational side, I think we agree that the function thing is more out there, although with more precise definitions, such as cell-cell interactions, that's first experiments happening where you can do pet cell sequencing, yeah. right? There's prediction tools, I think Sarah's, uh, what's it called, cell phone to be a fantastic name, just came out a week <laughs> ago, right? And obviously those are all not perfect, but you could start approaching this. But initially, the list of parts where everyone agrees, with, which seems to be not yet. Yeah. Well, just, just to add to this, and people can add, um, you know, I agree that like, we should then, going back to Kevin, I know I don't have one. I'll, I'll oh, look at this. This is awesome. Thank you. I'll, I'll give it back to you in a sec. Um, uh, so if we're going to go and have the same criteria, as like what type of metadata we should systematically all record and release with our data sets to allow this. And then I agree with you if we have milestones, like, like can people also come in and like, how are you thinking about like, what's a good tissue sampling for you? If let's say you're doing, I don't know, lung, um, how many cells is a good atlas for you, right? Like if you're gonna go milestone, which is actually a good practical question of like, what's a good draft for you? 20,000, who came? I'm driving an auction here. Yeah, I mean, I was going to go actually along exactly the same lines as the, as the previous comment. Is this idea of, you know, yeah, we don't have to do everything at once. So it's true. If validation may not be scalable in a single experiment, right? We talk about scale for single cell transcriptomics now, but there's a lot of scientists in the world, right? There's a lot of data being generated. So I think an important part of this also is how do you engage with the community so that relatively isolated validation experiments can be effectively incorporated into this this huge profiling effort, right? So maybe we're mapping all the immune cells in the lung, but one person may be doing a perturbation of alveolar macrophages is one specific thing. And I think a key part for the HCS initiative is to facilitate bringing that information in yeah. sort of some, somehow. Into this so two, com entrance. two comments on that. The fir first one is I think these type of lists here that we just put on blackboards now, that we can all do by electronically registering at some point, maybe if the paper's published or potentially, hopefully if you put it in bioarchive even earlier on, these things could start to happen. The second part is an answer, or a sort of a comment maybe to, to what, what Jimmy was suggesting, turn this into a machine learning problem. Let's not even do it on the function, because they could ask as well, but just first for the annotation. We've been seeing in studies that this is actually not that tough a machine learning problem once annotation is well done. And so in fact, we've been profiling very complex nonlinear things towards something rather simple. And actually, the simple ones very often are, are enough across multiple studies. So this is not that hard a problem, it's just that in many situations you're just still lacking those refined data for those subpopulations, right? Mm -hmm. So I would, I would see though, if the subpopulation, particularly with perturbations, become complex enough, we could think now, we will have, I guess, the biggest data set in an immune set, this will be by far the largest early on, to maybe even turn this into one of those big machine learning competitions, you've heard about those. I would, I don't know if you need to raise visibility even more, but you would get at least, <laughs> <laughs> but you would get a different community in, right? So, so there might be really something to be learned. There might be natural language processing guys that because you call the lanes differently than yeah. someone else and, and nobody did want to use your ontology, maybe someone wants to then work on that, right? And so I think that's a nice vision, but it has to be, I guess, done once we have a bit more of those aggregated things. And I think one unique feature is, you know, these are it's a human population we are studying, so we will have natural perturbation as one of our perturbations in place as long as these data are reported. So one aspect which could be very valuable for the community is if you know, a recommendation comes out, these are uh, metadata which will make your data usable in these machine learning studies. And again, lo looping back to the ontology community that we utilize the standards in the field, I think would become very valuable very quickly and might be one impact this group could have with relatively modest effort. Excellent point. GWAS have solved that by meta studies, right? Absolutely. More or less. And I think this is, uh, this is an approach. This could be like a huge meta study with different aspects.
to make a comment on nomenclature and function, we're still learning the function of immune cells constantly and have been for the next 30, you know, will be for the next 100 years. Um, I would see, using the Google Maps analogy, you could describe a cell type or cell state as you would on a map. And then you could think about function as the reviews of the cafe at that particular site, right? And then add in various things. And the opening hours will change, and it might go from this house to that house, depending on inflammatory state. So having a mechanism by which a paper can be linked to a given cell state. And I see the day when any validation of immune cell type will say, point, point it to me on the human cell atlas, which present 20 different patients in a healthy control or your vaccinated control, show me that it's real and only then will we accept that as a functional generalizable feature. Or you've got to work really hard. That is Because people have made their careers in immunology on obscure yeah. cell types that turn out not to exist. So I think this is going <laughs> to... Not much of a career. <laughs> well, sometimes they go for decades and then uh, only then is that broken. But sometimes people are talking about the same thing. So I see this as a way to create landmarks to keep immunologists honest. So do you recommend having that as something that when you um, write a paper, you would, there would be a place where you would go and actually put your data in and it would find the position on the map. So it would be nice if someone wrote that and that can be done that would keep aggregating. I mean, the Human Cell Atlas community and the Human Cell Atlas should be the ones that as a group decide how to do that. And, and when you focus yeah, on that cell type, actually, just that, exactly. Yeah. The cancer cell has just, you did that for, for cancer genetic profiles. You take cancer to cell lines and so on. You have a C, of, and then you have a new one, and right. you buy some similarity measure, you place it in the map. Right. And, and of course, you have to have the reference uh, established, but that's a good way to do it. Yeah. So for, for this, the frameworks are there to write so those tools, <coughs> right? Yeah. You, know, you all saw the DCP, which won't yet have annotation, but let's say we have it at some point, and hopefully it's coming sooner than you see it. But then we have the portals as sort of this, this stuff out there that everyone can contribute, so particularly computational people, right, can be writing those and then could put front end potentially integrating many of, of those, those data sets. Depending on, on how the processing goes, that might need additional resources, but I, I, th I think it's sort of in, in, by structure in place and I think one should learn from those list challenges. So, so just to kind of link to all of this and, and then I did pass the mic. Um, just because it's linking to the SOP and the way we generate data if you want to start merging everything. And I think there are some very practical and excellent comment about like, you know, we need to start with some first drafts. So I, I would love to hear, I think the community would love to hear about your thoughts about what's a first draft for you. Like, how are you going about a tissue about, you know, are, are you saying you've profiled lung as a first draft if you've done it? I'm, I'm picking lung, but I can pick any organs. If you've done like a couple of lobes and five people, uh, somebody said 20,000 cells, like what's, what's the first draft for you? How are you thinking about it? What are the modalities you're thinking of using beyond single RNA sequencing? Is there any forms of validation for your clusters? Like what's, what's the first immune cell at, at last draft for an organ? But you want to say something? For an organ or for, for, oh, for, oh, for a question? Oh, for like a question. Oh, for a question. Know, what is, what, what yeah. level of depth do you need to get yeah. to believe it? Or for the B cells study that we heard before. And, and, and yeah. just, to, just to add to this, you know, is it like one organ everything or lineage everywhere? Which they're both good, but like, you know, like somebody, there's a B cells study from Spain, right? Like, mm -hmm. love to hear about the thoughts. I guess, yeah, I mean, what my one thought was with uh, one challenge potentially with this idea of, of broader community engagement with, you know, every paper being mapped is, you know, we have this, we just discussed the importance of harmonization. You've just thrown that out of the window now, right? Because now you have people doing independent experiments however they feel like it, and now you're trying to link that data in. But at the same time, I think that that puts a greater burden on having a really nice, robust reference data set where we can say we've taken out all that variability, and if your cell type is completely aberrant and isn't represented here, you probably did something wrong, right? You probably didn't discover something new. It increases the burden, I guess, on maybe demonstrating some of this. But I think that's one of the, the idea of bringing in as much data as possible, but but how do you balance like restricting data only to that that's been generated under strict conditions so we're all agreed upon how it's generated versus trying to have more data and then capture potentially a greater range of states, which may include more technical uh, states? So I can comment again from, from the data side. I think we agree upon that we don't want to be restrictive. So we don't want to say, OK, this is not sort of according to those rules, but you have to disclose whatever you did, right? So if you find something strange and you did something strange, then you, you, know, you would see if it doesn't map. But you might have something relevant. Yes, but I think nowadays it is rather easily possible to integrate robustly across data sets. At the single cell genomics conference that happened these three, three days before, that quite a few different methods have been proposed along those lines to really do massive integration, right? And 
they are also starting to get flexible enough that you don't force everything to be like on that ball that has been generated, generated as reference data, but if something sticks out, as you suggest, with diseases, right, they will be all over, then you would actually be able to still find that. How to then agree upon that this is noise or not, you know, I guess it might be, well, might make, like how people then use it, like, you know, we, we don't throw our web pages that are bad, but some are just not visited because they're not, not good, so maybe by, by these type of approaches you might be able to. So, so your argument here, Fabian, is that it's okay if we don't have standard SOP, we'll integrate and then we'll figure out what's good and bad based on what overlaps and doesn't overlap? <laughs> yes, yes, okay, I don't okay. Just, just, just summarizing so the thoughts, okay. <laughs> I just know, I, that works, I, I just can't be realistic that like yeah, yeah. one SOP across. No, there's no uh, way we have one SOP, but it's right. interesting to think about how people are thinking about like sampling tissues and so forth. But certainly we've um, also found in the lab that sometimes when you integrate more data sets, the problem actually gets easier rather than harder because the biology stands out over the noise. Can I ask one question about uh, SO SOPs uh, with respect to cell quality? What I think everyone agrees upon, or I think not much, much of us observe, that cells have very different viability with respect to actually getting their transcriptomes out. So if you use single cell RNA seq to quantify cell populations, we do get a bias. What is the current state? Uh, is, everyone, is anyone correcting against those biases? Do you go back to FAX cells where you believe more? What is the current way how people approach it experimentally? I mean, I mean, there's a question behind, but I mean, to answer that question directly, I do. <laughs> to kind of but check ground that, truth. But you do this with discrete fax scales, because you don't have That's to correct. I mean, at least you should make sure that you rediscovered all the knowns when you do your single sign sequencing. Based on relative frequency abundance. And, and then we at least, you know, we, there's like decades and decades of um, knowledge in immunology, right? So we know about rare cell types and state and those that are yeah. sticky and so forth. So if you cannot, Capture that, and yeah. there's going to be bias depending on how you process your tissue. Actually, some cells you actually need to use harsher enzymatic digestion to get them. Some of the stromal cells, which are going to affect other cell types. So, depending on the, how you process your tissue, you will get different populations. But you need to know which one you're biasing for or against. And so, so, there's statistical ways to correct for that. But as far as I know, none of, of, of those type of things that we upload do have any means even of adding this type of fax data and so on. Yeah, but that's like, I mean, it's, it's a single cell. Fox, so Fox as a metadata set? Thank you. Um, Chris, a person from Cambridge. I want to just make a couple of points related to this heterogeneity that we're talking about. Um, one is uh, clearly there's a distinction between health, healthy, and disease, but actually these are two ends of a very broad spectrum. Um, and actually, most, most donors will not fit neatly in either of those two categories. One, one is that, and the second point is about age, and actually, of course, the immune experience and the impact of age is very important. So the things that I think that are pretty critical to bring these two together ultimately is the donor demographics. In other words, having detailed information about the, the state uh, of our donors, not just you know, which tissues we process and what, uh, using what SOPs, but actually what's the background of those patients, what drugs, what medication were they on, were they smokers, what sort of infective history they had. Uh, and I think capturing that data is really important on a prospective manner that actually ultimately when we have the, uh, the, the millions and billions of cells that we've got, we can actually go back and uh, try and make sense of those factors. The time to even acknowledge it potentially, right? Yeah. So Ulrike says that in the data we tend to lose like some genes. And if we can discuss the influence of dropouts, in, and the technological limitations. Yeah, so that because we lose some markers in some of the data, so if we can discuss the dropouts. I mean, that goes to Fabian wanting to combine all the data sets. And, and, and the more data sets you have, the more likely you are to you know, correct for some of these dropouts. But you should comment on this. So I, th I think, again, from, from those meetings, what we see is that the current state of the art is that People like aggregating close by cells. There's different techniques, standard presented one, there's this meta cell concept. We have we call it a projective graph, but from those, obviously, that's a very natural way of enriching then uh, dropped out uh, genes. Other, other than that, for many of the downstream analysis, such as clustering trajectories and so on, methods have been made very robust with respect to these type of things. So you can build this into the models with this dropout. In the end, if it's about particular, particularly expressed ones, I think integration to 
because I guess we mostly speak about droplet type of experiments, right? Would be then to really go towards uh, smart seek. What's the smart seek three coming out from Rickson? So that might be even better. That's four. something. Four even. Yeah. Four. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so this inference type type of ideas uh, would be one question. The other one, I I, I don't know. There was a suggestion that about tying into the analogy. I mean, we're kind of dropping all the bulk experiments that we have, particularly from purified population. Mm -hmm. That might be one idea that potentially also Richmond was already expressed once. I don't know if someone's going along this route. We also actually. Which you do also, by the way, you do the discrete parts too, right? Yeah. yeah and, and we actually do sometimes bulk from rare cells to kind of help with our reference for mapping. And, and that doesn't add that much cost, actually, if you're enriching by sorting to do a little bit of a bulk. Well, uh, depending on how much starting material we have, we try to get at least five to ten thousand cells. So that's an interesting SOP question. It's helping. I just wanted to respond to the metadata point. Um, obviously, it's important to have metadata to collect it. Uh, the DCP has a fairly good metadata spreadsheet that can capture many, many of the things you said. However, it is important to understand that the metadata is not, is not necessarily reliable, and we will probably not know all of the factors. Um, either they can't be known or, or, or uh, the people don't provide the information. Um, so in the cancer field, at least, for instance, I understand that there was, um, you know, the smoking status was, uh, in, it turned out, could be much better predicted based on gene expression than, <laughs> than the patient response. So... Um, in the first place, yeah. Yeah. So you, you had to learn it, yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's why I said it's important to collect it, but we can't uh, assume that it's going to solve the whole problem. Yeah. Okay. Nobody wants to comment about, like, what's the first atlas? Okay. Okay. That's not a popular question. You know, there was a... Genome sequencing of the human genome as an example, we still don't have a final version of the human genome. So, you but know, I th we had a first version and a second version. Now we're on version 38. Mm -hmm. So, you didn't ask about the final one. Is this the first version? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, the first one is when, when you, number one in the major project list, when that comes out, that's going to be my first yeah. immuno. And then I'm going to compare all my data against that. So, so. you say this one is the first. Did you hear that? <laughs> it just happens to have the number one. Well, <laughs> but we've been waiting. We've been waiting for. Okay. I mean, as a consortium, it would be also nice to write a paper together. I guess an immune cell atlas paper, and say to the community or beyond community or to the world that this will be the first draft of the of the immune atlas. And for that, I think it'd be better to have more than one yeah, group. But. That too, so with the idea of doing like a metadata analysis, like what yeah. are you thinking about? Yeah, a um, bit broader than just one institute. No, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, no yeah. I feel like, but like thinking about it, right, because people will have specific effort. It's, it's a very good idea to come in all together to kind of answer this question about annotation and so forth, right? But like how would you envision this? Yes. So actually, do we have a Slack channel for this topic? Do we have a structure? Slack. A Slack. Slack channel. A Slack. Oh, we can always add I another Slack that. channel. <laughs> but like, um, some people work well with Slack, and some others less. So it's good to you know think about other forms of structure. But yeah, we can add a Slack channel. Uh, that was, I have one, one question we wrote down is about uh, the imaging part. Mm -hmm. That uh, so I put some validation, which we can definitely switch. I was trying to get people to say about like okay. draft, but it's okay. It's not <laughs> a so, topic. So I mean, the reason that we started to do a lot of people is, and and, and I was a human genetist first. I think there is actually there's going to be much more phenotypic diversity between individuals and genotypic diversity. So I think, you know, thinking about eventually wanting to do, for example, the 1,000 genomes version or the all of us version of human cell atlas, I think we need to start thinking about that much earlier. Um, and, and so we're certainly trying to do that. But, um, yeah, just thought that so we should like keep that in mind. Age, what are we thinking? Ethnicity, you mentioned Yeah, I mean, all, all of, yeah, like all of that is going to be important. Right. But should, 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 but should we randomly, unbiasedly select maybe 100 individuals or okay. fix yes. on 500 individuals? Yeah. But what is the additional gain beyond cell type specificity? You 
see variance between the algorithm like one field? Yes. So, right, beyond cell type specificity, it's about quantifying gene expression differences. So gene expression is a phenotype. That's going to be, right, so the next set of things that we want to do beyond just... QTLs, right? Yes. Well, it doesn't have to be genetic correlation with gene expression. It could be age correlation with gene expression. It could be gender correlation with gene expression. But if we think about beyond phenotyping cell types and getting cell type proportion differences, but looking at cell type specific expression differences between individuals, then... then what it means in populations? It could be variants as well, but we'll get into that sort of like later. First, right. Second right. moments are also important, obviously. But like cell type proportions, where are you going to learn differently from like big facts analysis? I can look at millions of cells at once for cell type as an immunologist, like thinking as an immunologist will look at you and be like, well, you know, we do this with like... But are, are there many facts-based epidemiological yeah. studies? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, so yeah. basically what you described was a then... No, but you also think it's a different expression. Right? Oh, yeah, you have a different expression. Mm. Okay, yeah. But also, like, response to vaccination, why does someone respond to the flu and someone does flu vaccine and someone doesn't? Is right. that encoded in yeah. the genetic plus the transcriptome? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to jump forward to the question, that, you know, what's, yes. a, what's the definition of the atlas? Thank you, Chris. All right. So, so, so <laughs> I, 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 you know. The distraction is for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so good news, bad news. Uh, for, so for comparison, there's the cancer genome atlas, mm -hmm. right? That was a project seven years and so on. Uh, it's finished now, complete. If you go and try to find the genome atlas, it ain't right. there. There's no atlas. The closest, there are a bunch of papers, you know, it's a, the closest. Too late, that one is. But there's a tree of data, there's lots of data. And the best, the closest thing to the atlas is, 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 is information portals, a small number of information portals, and implied in those portals are information trees. So fast forward, I think it might be a good idea to come up with a concept paper from, the, from, from HCA that says, this is what we imagine the atlas might be, and I'm just going to give you one tentative solution, which is it's a set of information trees. One of them is the one we saw this morning. You have the body. You click on the organ, and you get down, go down an information tree to whatever level of details. But there are other information trees, not to enumerate them now. So I'm going to think, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting something like three or four or five information trees following different ways of thinking about it, and that would become a reasonable draft, and that I think I would put out fairly early, not wait three or four years mm -hmm. as a concept and have it open for discussion. So, so there have been a few preview or sort of discussion papers that have been already put out, but I think, you know, second one to mention that there might be an interest in writing such an additional paper. And what, I know, it. what I noticed is that other organ-specific atlas are starting to do these types of things, <coughs> so it might be, let's not do it for, because, you know, there might be specificalities to <coughs> other ones, so if you think such an organization type of principle would be important for the immune cell atlas. There have been, so I, I know for example in the deep learning community, you know, there have been actually some type of online collaborative writing type of efforts to write actually such a thing. And it might be possible to set up if, if people are interested. Otherwise, you have to get someone to actually really do it. But a few people have taken the lead on that, yeah. otherwise you get yeah. So we do, we do have a draft of a white paper for the immune cell atlas, and we also have a draft in the white paper for a version one atlas in general. But I think that we can... But white that paper? For the immune cell, yeah, in the white paper. We can let's bring those together into a common document mm -hmm. and actually do what you're saying. And together as a group, actually, let's try to define the structure and what would, and be, what uh, would be the atlas. And obviously, every paper is unique and different so that everything we've heard here today. But, but it's this tree. Yeah. 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 Tree, tree type. Small of number. Yeah. And I hate to do that, but atlas for whom? Is this for <laughs> immunologists, for molecular biologists, for bioinformaticians, for patients? for clinicians, yeah. and so in KPMP, we really are doing a systematic outreach to these various stakeholders and learning what they expect from an atlas. And you will find a lot of very low-hanging fruits where you can have significant impact to a user community, which is not on the radar screen of us here in this room. And, but this might be a question for the larger uh, human cell atlas community than this one. On the, on the one hand, I agree with you. On the other hand, and I think if Google would have thought first of that, they wouldn't have a ma made a map because we had maps. Yeah, but, but I'm pretty sure when they made the first one, they had already in mind that there are different communities with different ideas about what this map should be. But they still put out a very simple map in the first place. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't care too much about who is going to be our first customer, so to say. I, I, I actually don't care. 
because there will be immunologists that will love that and others that will hate that in the first place. And they, the, the ones that, that hate it in the first place, they will learn over time that it's actually cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't but there care. is a representation, how you represent it and how you put it out. Yes. Will is completely different for each population. And, and, and the aspect with the low-hanging fruits in the areas that we don't yet see, that's like a different one. Hopefully someone picks it up and then writes something up out of that, right? But you have to have something else for it. But if we allow multiple data hierarchies, like Chris is proposing, that can be targeted to different communities yeah, and different exactly. use cases. Different views, essentially, of the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the portals are essentially for, right? right? So, I mean, that's a mechanism yeah, we in have place. one view that we're trying to produce. SOPs? Yeah. Well, so, so, so I, th I think that's maybe a good outcome to say that we will have multiple views. We, we won't have, like, the one picture of the atlas, right? But how do we... So, like, let's say, like, your classical immunologist wants to yeah. know, like, wants to know if he has to redesign all of his flow panel and it will not be so happy with us, right? So if he has on top of it, like, I don't know, a dozen tree of information to navigate, which is okay, it could be the first version of the draft, but like, you know, going back to who's the client, and in our case, there's gonna be a lot of immunologists, oh, and you wanna come in on this, like, yeah. how, how do we think about this, right? Or do you have to uh, wait and figure out it's cool? No, no clue, I think, I think you know, I would say we need, you know, you don't need for the whole atlas already a level of information that the immunologist could pick the panel for every tissue in every situation. But if you make a showcase and like, you know, this is the first atlas of all the cells, but in this particular area, we basically go in a way that you can use that information and that will come up later in the other areas as well. Then I think that's fixed already enough to say, okay, I now know what I have to expect. Okay. Here I can use it already and the other ones will come. So like version 2.0, 3.0, right, and so on. To get a buy-in of the community. Yeah. 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 Um, so I do think we need a group to figure out what the representation should look like yes. for immunology. We're not going to figure that out in a few minutes, but I think oh. that clear that we need to do that. Yeah, most yeah. all very good points. I think we do need a first draft of some sort. We need a first draft of an atlas. It may not be perfect. It will not be perfect. It will continue to kind of like be refined, as what everybody says. Uh, and it may not cater for all of the stakeholders involved, but I think it is important to think about the stakeholders. At the end of the day, a lot of our research comes from either public money or you know, individuals who've kindly donated and also the patients who've donated the samples. And it's ultimately to advance health and you know, new ways of treating disease. So I think we do need to care. Um, we will never please everyone with our first draft, but we need a first draft. Okay. Yeah, so there's a mechanism for that, right? You know, in the Human Cell Atlas white paper yeah. for when a release is uh, 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 being done. So who's, 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 who's leading that? I mean, you guys know? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> I think it's for us to lead for each, uh, for each atlas every, type. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be different for, for everyone. No, but, but I, okay. So I think this, uh, this is a question we should at least give back to the uh, OC. To the because the thing is, with the, the immune cell atlas has, true, the immune cell atlas has the strange property that we know of, which is that it's everywhere. And so, so we, we're not going to have a full body immune cell atlas very soon, although it may not be that far away, but we, we could potentially, in a metadata approach, take all the atlases from all the organs, extract all the immune cells from all the people that have had the, you know, and just take those out, put that into a, uh, version one, and that might be a good idea because then here among us, we don't necessarily need to do every tissue, but um, across the whole human cell atlas, there will be every tissue, and so a kind of a meta so would such data a version be useful. Yeah, because absolutely. This is because something with these alignment tools we're nowadays possible to do, and that basically you could then map each of the different ones that everyone is producing on, on such a thing. So that is actually mm -hmm. making that would exceptionally useful because then mm -hmm. organ centric activities can quickly define what are organ specific. Yep. Absolutely. And if you harmonize across all these, so you can have some relationship, mm -hmm. as we talked about for the last hour, between the different clusters or however you're going to define your states, across tissues uh, and across individuals, then that will also give people an idea of how, what, they're, what they can be comparing to. So for example, if I do a study in the kidney, but the liver person did it on that cell and has like a much more extensive functional study, mm -hmm. I want to be able to draw on it in a, yeah. the correct way. But if I have no way to do that, so and it's... you could actually then map, so the cell yeah. interaction part, the functionality, that yeah. could be then... Yeah, that could be the then make, atlas, right? then you make hypotheses that lead you to the actual experiments. And then machine so, learning is a great method, it's called transfer learning, yeah. that solves yes. some of those problems, mm -hmm. from one organ to another. But 
I, and I think the version one of the atlas should should be that because I think that's a reasonable place. We're not we're not waiting for every project to completely finish and get huge depth, but we have enough from a lot of places to bring together. Something well, we would like kind that. of wait for the other atlases to produce something, right? Well, they are. There are already there are already some provisional sharing, provisional atlases for many tissues. So, so this right? is, I think this is something that makes this this type of atlas rather special in contrast to the other exactly. the specific ones, and that's I think a very nice point that's maybe not yet. Mentioned that much, so I think oh, but I think that's part thing. of the fun is that you know a t the same the same cell type in the kidney and the, and the, and yeah. the brain. And what, makes it what makes it different? That that is part of the fun of the of that kind of atlas that the immune system will have, and it'll be different from all the others, other than the vascular system and a few other places where you have. Um, can I make a request whatever. for the computational community? If you want buy-in from immunologists. You can create some biaxial plots. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I know. No, 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 no. No, they can't be if, if you can, honestly, you will get a huge buy. I know RNA doesn't equal protein. In some cases, you might have site seek. But if you can click on a cluster and compare two markers, yeah. it'll be like the Imgen resource where immunologists are looking at it daily for their favorite marker against another one. It's boring to you hardcore machine learners, but really important to immunologists. In, in a yes. form that's daily yeah. usable. You yeah. can't just go and deconvolute the t for the top markers and kind of figure it out. Yeah. So, so yeah. This, this is, this is yeah. duly noted. I, I should mention, again, there is multiple portlets that can show you the data differently. Yeah. I want to highlight one that the uh, fantastic CCI engineering team have, is developing with resources that we on the research sites n never can muster. They even have graphical user interface experts. I think this, at least in our lab, is now very quickly replacing the loop browser type of mm -hmm. sort of really simple things. The cell by gene. The cell by gene, exactly. It has a nice plugin from Scanpy. You can just start it right mm -hmm. away. It's, it's really easy to mm -hmm. use. You can have it as a server. You can check mm -hmm. the ratio. I, so I think in a white paper that represents the first atlas, we, can, we yeah. should specify <laughs> the pieces that we need in order to have that be a functional atlas, a useful atlas. Yeah. Yeah. So Maybe just to add uh, to this, because I was well. wanting to say that for a long time already, I think it comes down to how you can query the data. And I think immunologists, I'm not really a hardcore immunologist, but I know that people look for, for example, for a certain cytokines or a certain uh, chemokines or maybe, uh, well, uh, antigen presentation. So these are, these are ways that you can um, then in silico gate your data and see what populations you get from the different tissues. Because this is then also independent of um, well, certain perceptions of what a particular cell type should be. And I think this will be important to incorporate in the atlas. It'll be critical. The viewing part of the yeah, it's actually interesting what Shilin mentioned because uh, we've had similar discussions ab about how to present data for SightSeq because m most of our customers are all flow cytometrists. Sorry. So actually we see it going the opposite way where you know initially we have to present the SightSeq data to them in biaxial plots, but then as people start using it more and more and they see our data being presented as TISNI plots or what have you later, whatever is developed, they're gonna start getting used to those types of data, which is a lot more efficient. Okay, please for don't get them used to TISNI. That's yeah. or, or not, <laughs> I'm just giving as an example. I mean, I know there's, there's other stuff out there. There are other ways better, to do yeah. it, but it depends on your question. You, sometimes you do need to buy it. Right. Right, right, right. Regardless of how other ways to show it up. Just one minor follow-up on that, though, is that on the biaxial plot representation, like one thing to keep in mind, though, is protein expression lends itself very well to biaxial plot displays. Gene expression does not because of the, of the dropout and all of those issues. So it's, uh, it's, it's just one. Better, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. But I would say the average, uh, I mean, I, I run like a, like a more of a core, and so we have a broad range of clients. And if I've ever given a biaxial plot of gene expression to a client, they would tell me that they want the money back because yeah. the experiment didn't work. So yeah. it's just something well, that's to keep smooth. I mean, uh, TCN essentially smoothed it for you, right? right. Because it aggregates so right. much. So, you know, you could you also do also do smooth. You can infer. Yeah. You don't see yeah. the drop yeah. of the True. Right. So, we, we, we have yeah, a few exactly. tools to sort of smooth the manifold and this imputation. It is actually really discussed. So, you know, but you could the flip, apply the flip side is, a, you know, is the, is the it boosts correlation. The thesis is going to be to hide bad data, but you know, it's a separate. <laughs> <laughs> there might be, though, still not bad. Maybe it's really for, because of the, of the strong correlation, there's actually really these imputation approaches might give you uh, uh, potentially not only prettier looking, but actually also more information about right. that. Right. So I guess it's, it's also with biaxial plots, but perhaps that, defining yeah. what the axes are, right? So I think, uh, I mean, TCN is one, but... I think maybe instead of instead of single genes though, like the idea of modules, I think becomes much more powerful than for gene expression, right? So if you can visualize one module versus another, 
and, and that way each access is some sort of an aggregate. So that way if you have a signature that, you know, like Rich defined, mm -hmm. the signature you defined, we can kind of compare those signatures rather than comparing individual genes. But, but what, what do you... The whole immunologist hands right. one step at a time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but what do you mean if you, if you want these to be produced without code, right? I mean, so you want the immunologist to go to the human yeah. cell atlas yeah. portal, yeah. click yeah. down on... Yeah. So you'd have to put all of your data on the portal first, yeah. right, yeah. obviously, and then... Okay, that's, a, that's an aspiration, I think. It has to be, like, yeah. my mom can go on there, <laughs> click a button, see the cell type. So you're a family with an No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> She's an architect. She's okay. no idea. Awesome. Can, can, I go, can I go back to the issue of the draft again? And I think it's a really great idea to take blood samples from different tissues in the atlas to make it a first draft, but I think there's also great value of actually doing the PBMCs <laughs> as, as a blood group. So I think we should somehow consider how we can increase the, the N and the number of individuals and the diversity to capture PBMC profiles across different genetic backgrounds. Uh, uh, maybe, one po maybe version 1.5, but mm -hmm. yeah. We should not ignore that part, I think. That's a good advice, a uh, good suggestion. I mean. uh, we only have um, 15 minutes to go. Uh, we were going to talk a bit more about validation to kind of bring the buy-in of uh, immunologists and how you go about validating a cluster. But uh, so we're welcome thoughts on this subject, although like I heard a lot of this is for the future. Um, otherwise, for the last 15 minutes, any thoughts, things we didn't discuss, uh, idea we should consider right away as a community, all are welcomed. On the topic of PBMCs, so I, so I would agree with that, right? The idea of, I think, profiling PBMCs from a very broad range of samples would be very valuable. Mm -hmm. And that's something that sounds like imminently non-fundable by most, like you can't write a grant saying we just want to profile a bunch of PBMCs. So should it be the role of the HCA to be encouraging some of these things that would have broad value as a resource that mm -hmm. might be more difficult for um, people to pursue independent funding for? Should we just try and be aggregating data that's being collected anyway? What's, what's the appropriate strategy? of this community and encouraging that. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. I, this is by no, just one idea is that I think funders like the CZI are going to be happy with straight out atlasing projects. But the way we think about it is in Australia to get funding we have to do a disease, but we'll always have some healthy controls. Right. And the healthy controls get there and the disease may or may not go up there. Yeah. Um, and I think if enough people do that, we'll have plenty of data. So I guess we'd have to ensure that metadata is being all the studies, the metadata is being collected in a way that's ultimately compatible. Mm -hmm. So there are also some large consortium efforts ongoing for like all of us is taking 50 mils of blood from a lot of sites and shipping it to Mayo. Um, so we are actively engaged in at least exploring a relationship with them to see if, you know, how many of those we can process. And there's blood banks and there, there are ways to, and certainly NIH has funded these, right, like large scale projects that may not always have a disease component. And just, just as an, an interesting point as I walk to you, him, um, when you do disease, does everybody has to do match controls or at some point can we just focus on disease patients and you know, use the data repository? Saving money. So, Chloe, going back to the validation point, I think a year ago Aviv said something very nice. She said we are expecting several iterations of the human cell atlas. So we, we know that we will not be complete or not even you know, completely correct in the first place. That doesn't matter because technology gets better, we get more information, we get other technology that fits in, and we saw that today. So I would say validation means also you put something out which you, by all means you have today, feel correct. That's fine. And then you basically, what I think is important to engage the community that is working on the tissue, in this case the, immune, uh, the Im immunologists, really engage them. So I think it's more about do we make them interested in that? Yeah, that's more important because if you get them interested, they will start validating like crazy. Yeah, because they say this is an enormous resource I cannot do myself. Yeah, I can learn about cells that I would never, never been touching, but now I have a, I have a very easy hypothesis. Yeah, I don't even need to think about it because it's in the atlas and I can work on something new, and they start to validate that. I think that's more important because we cannot even. In consider all the tests and all the assays that would have to be done to validate some of the cell types, some of the functionality, and so on. But I think that's, that's kind of how you amplify. And if then something comes out, 
you know, they find out in the field that something we, we, we basically pushed out as a structure, as a cell type, as a, as a trajectory that is not true. And is, you know, after I have engaged in with the field that showed new data, then we correct it. That's the next version, that's the next iteration. I don't see any problem with that general phenomenon. The, the key is make them interested. Okay, so, so first sort of new take home for me was we aggregate immune cells that we have from the current existing atlases of different tissue, and you're advocating putting them out early enough with annotations that we transport from whatever we've done, maybe on PDCs or other type of data sets. But then say, okay, this is current state, please go ahead and, and, and push it. I think the, the just Very quick, uh, it's an engineering problem. It's not your specific aims where you have to have the definite answer. But as engineering do, you know, iterate and iterate quickly and, you know, put it out quickly, fail quickly, and make it better. And it sometimes can get embarrassing, but if the community is standing behind that concept, it really provides the quickest results. Yeah, then I, sa I would say that, I mean, as a community, if we come together to do the annotation, to contribute our data early, and to work with a group of computationalists who are interested in putting it together, as a broad atlas, I think we can get there pretty quickly for that version one that's the kind of, you know, whatever it is. However, whatever we can get to in the first one, I think we can get to it if we agree on, on moving toward that direction, I think. Yeah. So I think writing it up and making it clear so that everybody knows what's needed, how to get there, we can all pitch in on tweaking that and making sure we got that. Yeah. Yeah. Sciences, Clarify the uncertainties. Exactly, but this needs more work, and then mm -hmm. you know, that's fine. Good. Uncertainties. Absolutely. So, Kyle is asking if there is any plan to validate the results in animals models. Mm -hmm. So, for clinical trials, mice and non human primates are used before that human trials, and how can these results be validated across the species? That's a good question. Well, for many of our projects, we're starting to do that more, uh, meaning we're taking the equivalent models of whatever we're doing in the animal and comparing, but that's just beginning. I don't know if anyone else has you know, experience or direction in that as well, but we're finding that that's, that's for us the next critical step because you know, that's the only way we can go do all the tests we, we want to do. So we need to know which models conform to the human in what way and which models conform in another, and which ones are completely off, you know, and so forth. So I think that's an actually really critical issue, but it hasn't been kind of the, you know, state admission of the HCA, because it's the Human Cell Atlas, but I think that that's going to be something that we need to do soon, not a long time from now. Yeah. And I haven't seen many studies doing it. There's a few. Is that the responsibility of the HCA? Or, or is that just that we have a resource that helps other people? I think it would be a good thing to, to make it a responsibility. So in, in one example of where it should be is that we want to understand what makes humans human. Right. And so you know, right. we, we just um, submitted a paper where, with the Allen Brain Institute mm -hmm. comparing human and mouse. Huh. And there are some cell types that we get a good match between the uh -huh. two, and then there are others that seem to be very unique to nice. human. Blood you did or some other? This is brain. Brain. Oh. Yeah. But so I, I, you know, part of it is what makes human human, and yeah. I think that's why you want to do some of the comparative analysis. Uh, the, the other point I was going to make in terms of validation is that I think it's also important for us to have a, a, an infrastructure so that when somebody does a validation study, finds the same cell type or whatever, they're probably doing it in the context of a different kind of experiment, and they're probably going to derive new information about that cell type. So mm -hmm. we have to be able to grow the knowledge base incrementally as part of the validation, mm -hmm. and we have to make that easy for people who are doing those experiments mm -hmm. to add that new knowledge. Absolutely. I was just going to have sort of one general question where people thought about um, whether it is worth putting more effort into artificial perturbation experiments or whether we're going to let the human <coughs> population and disease do the perturbation for us. The temporal <laughs> component is th when you when you're doing a, a, a deliberate perturbation, you control the time course, and that's the yeah. that's the most the best thing to be able. And the perturbation. Oh, right. You're right. relying entirely on just biological. You don't I think there's enormous opportunity to do that. I'm not sure if it's really the first draft of the human 
immune atlas. But um, I mean, it's certainly possible because of editing. For example, you can knock out every gene in the genome, at least in T cells. Not other cells are harder. But um, yeah, I mean, I think we're certainly big fans of artificial perturbation. I was wondering, you talked about modalities. You know, the human cell atlas has next to the single cell RNA seq sort of this big second column of, of image based analysis. And there's a lot of talk about those techniques getting to maturity. Is any of those I don't know, 17 projects considering image based I don't know, localization or, or inclusion of such things? And if yes, uh, how would that be integrated? Because this is like a completely different ballgame, I would say. Yeah, I mean, we've been working on that for some time, especially looking at subcellular localization. I think, I think we all know biology is 3D, um, and we know that maybe as much as I think everybody in the room is sort of a almost religious believer in transcriptome and RNA number equals cell type or cell state. I don't want to start that debate. <laughs> but, um, but it's interesting because I think distribution of RNA and protein is showing us some discordance to that idea. So um, we, we've worked on a lot of computational tools and image-based tools to do that at high bandwidth right now. And so we'll be releasing some a little bit later this year that we can use to, and especially I think uh, immune cells are very good and easy candidate for validation of this. So in this case, you're talking about one cell imaged in terms of subcellular localization. That's right, yeah. I was just um, thinking about how do we um, engage immunologists in terms of the validation experiments. Partly this is going to be dependent on the funding schemes that are available. Um, and most immunologists now will probably also want to be generating single cell data. So this division of, you know, so and so does the single cell data generation and so and so does the validation. How will we actually make it practical in terms of the buy-in from the immunologists and the actual delivery. And who do we go to to ask for funding in terms of we would like to now validate our single cell findings? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the communication I think people were talking about is how do you communicate the data in such a way that people can actually read it and, <laughs> and understand it. And I think that... But also want to do the validation. Well, that we can't, we can't make anyone want to do it. But I think, we, I think if we communicate it way clearly enough, then I think we can, uh, you know, people will be able to read it and follow up on, on results. I, I agree completely. Okay. Hello. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to return to the imaging question because I'm both an immunologist and a uh, microscopist. So I, that's exactly what I, and I'm in the, at the NIH in the Germain laboratory. Um, so yeah, I think it's absolutely essential to provide a spatial context for these immune cell interactions. And it can actually overcome some of the technical limitations that we discussed like isolating those rare cell types because you don't have to worry about digestion like the stromal cell components. Additionally, you can look at state by looking at phosphorylated proteins, and that's things that we do routinely in the lab. So now what we've, we've partnered with Donna Farber uh, and at Columbia University, and we've obtained lots of different organs from donors. Uh, and that's interesting, too, the tissue quality. It's one thing to look at transcriptional, but to see the tissue you see, the decomposition of, you know, structural proteins, the, it's very different from tissues that we obtain from surgery and resection, uh, and that has largely to do with the cold ischemic time. But anyway, so we're assembling, we have quite a bit of organs, and we're looking at multiplex, like 40plex imaging, not only just in thin tissue sections, but also thicker sections, because there's a sampling bias. You talk about depth of read, but certainly how thin are your sections, and you miss, you know, these, <coughs> these systems, uh, germinal centers, follicular dendritic cells, are three-dimensional, so we really want to capture that. And so I really want to be involved. We certainly have lots of organs we're retaining and optimizing methods to um, interrogate these immune cells. Yeah, antibodies, antibodies, but we can also do fish. So antibody would be comparable to the protein. Fish we certainly need for others. And then there's your, the technical limitation is how good are your antibodies. So we have ways of annotating those and SOPs mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, I think spatial imaging is the final frontier, actually. It's not the... <laughs> And, and just again to your question of how to engage immunologists, it goes back to Moses' point. If, if we can get the data out as quickly as possible in kind of just a description of the highest expressed genes, all the immunologists, ha immunologists have their favorite genes that are expressed in the cell populations that they're studying in their lab, then they'll come in and validate that and do all the legwork. So I really like the idea of getting the data out as soon as possible and not committing to an annotation until we have the immunologists come in and 
validate them. How are they going to stop you from wrap up for testing these at the next month? Oh, it's just, I could use microphone, sorry. Um, just in the way of Imgen, I mean, I use Imgen daily to find out whether X gene is expressed in my cell type. And if it is, it sends me on a path. But it's not because Imgen contacted me and told me, hey, this is what it looks like. It, it was just in a way that was accessible to me. And I don't, maybe I should, I don't I attribute Im Imgen to their resource in my discovery. It was just a resource where I found it and went on to use it. So I'm not sure that we have to actively engage immunologists as long as it's tactile enough for them to access it. I think that's the most important thing. So we should wrap it up. But Does anyone yeah. have any suggestions <clears throat> for what they would like to be done as a community next? In other words, we could work. We don't have to have a meeting physically. We can continue to work together on certain questions or ideas or directions based on what we talked yeah. about today. Like what time so anyone wants to, I mean, we already yeah. talked about some of the things we would do, so I won't repeat it, but does anyone want to add um, in the last five minutes ideas or things that they think are really critical? So it's, it's past the it's 4.30, oh. yeah. yeah. Oh. So in one minute, any other ideas? <laughs> <laughs> like, how can we continue the discussion? Yeah. If, for example, PBMC is to take a test case, if there were SOPs for how you... Mm -hmm. I know we shouldn't necessarily all have the same one, but it would be nice for many of us to have the same one, yeah. or yeah. two or three, to have the SOPs for that, yeah. what metadata we should be collecting where possible, mm -hmm. um, so that we've got everything possible so that we don't come back and go, oh, I wish we captured this, that, and the other, or did it this way and the other. That would be useful. Yeah, yeah. basic collection yeah. and metadata. Physical collection and, and, you know, information collection, what do you want to do? Yeah. So also just a clear, uh, I, think, I think there's really clear guidance also on sharing data sets. Like mm -hmm. if, we, if we want to contribute data sets, what's mm -hmm. the best way to go about doing that? Just right, and that's speaking. going to come... That's going the to come. Has that, right? Yeah, right. that will come. That will not be our immune specific problem. Yeah. It's actually possible right now, right? Yeah. Well, on the topic of SOPs, definitely for flow and imaging that you would contribute which clone you use, which lot mm -hmm. for your antibody, because mm -hmm. you'll get varying results depending on what you're looking at. I'm sure you already incorporate that, but that's very mm -hmm. important. Yeah, if anyone has looked at cell papers recently, they, they, they have the list <laughs> of every antibody and catalog number, which is good. Right. Right. So we can add to it. So, but we can certainly, as the immune group, write that down and make it clear. And uh, we, I don't think we've specifically laid out an immune section for that. So that would be good. <laughs> Good answer. Or PDCs. All right. Yeah. Yeah. One, one, one thing I would just recommend about, about the data sharing part is if you really start uploading data, they will be processed in a similar way. So I would really also advocate sharing whatever papers you will be writing, the computational aspects, which will surely differ between the different labs. And I Actually, think some synchronization will have to happen there as well. So I, I think, um, the, was it the tabulous? Anyway, the mouse, yeah, the mouse uh, <laughs> census paper, they did a really good job. They shared all of the notebooks and the analysis in, like real time. Um, I'm trying to convince my graduate students to do that right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I wonder if we shouldn't say, let's work together to build version one of the immune cell yeah. atlas and yeah. say, whoever wants to contribute a data set, yeah. we'll start a project. You know, this is the timeline to contribute it. We would contribute our vaccine data yeah. set. And, you know, yeah. and maybe let's, that would be a really nice action item. From, I think from so. Dreams. Good. So we'll, we'll create a, 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 a common document with some of the action items that we came up with, and people can put their comments in there, and then we can try to compile based on those comments that you add. We'll create like a final, or a more final version that people can go. Yeah, if we could make a timeline, I, mean, I think we could do this. Is based on this discussion today, we could do this in a month, let's say, something like that. I don't think we need months to do, to, to go through what we just discussed. I don't think we can all be in, in, invested in massive email, email communications, but I think the HCA channels on the Slack they are quite useful for that. Mm -hmm. So just making an ICA one there, I don't know if it's already active.
doesn't end up being shown. That might be uh, That's a, good a useful idea. communication part. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Should I report on all of these? I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>